today the topic is decentralizing AI, transforming data and intelligence. And we have four very special speakers with us today. First one being Aten, the CEO and founder of ZKGI. Chris, the CEO of Verita. Doug, who's the CMO of Exhibits. And Jeff, who is the foundation council member of Debrain Chain. So first off, can each one of the speakers give a brief introduction about themselves and the project please starting with Atom? I can go first. Thank you so much for having me. This is Doug with Exhibits. Um, so I'm the CMO of Exhibits. Prior to Exhibits, I was uh, with QuickNode, which is an RPC provider, if you're not familiar. Um, ran, was the first employee there and ran revenue. Uh, sales, uh, marketing, et cetera, for, for that organization. It took them from six, a zero to $6 million run rate in about 30 months. Prior to that, worked with the same founding team at Beluga CDN, which is a content delivery network, um, and kind of same story with that organization and, and got my uh, in, entrance in, in crypto in about 2019. Um, so Exhibits is, uh, provides a platform that democratizes access to uh, AI GPU compute resources by financializing the compute side and then by tokenizing enterprise grade GPUs, Exhibits allows individuals, individual users to own and benefit from high performance AI infrastructure, creating direct exposure to assets and yield. Um, so participants contribute, uh, contributions go towards the expansion of enterprise grade GPU clusters enhancing compute capacity and efficiency while also earning maximum returns. Um, so with proprietary software and hardware, we uh, reduce operating costs and then maximize compute output, generating substantial value for participants. Perfect, can we go with Aten next? Hey everyone, thank you uh, for uh, being here in the spaces. I'm Ethan, the uh, founder and CEO of ZKAGI. At ZKAGI, we're building an end-to-end -end decentralized infrastructure network for confidential compute or privacy AI, as we like to call it. Um, so essentially, we uh, guarantee data sovereignty and uh, uh, privacy uh, in our you know, AI network, and we give you access to complex AI models and large language models through our network. Um, so this is uh, this is what we're doing and uh, we're very happy to partner with uh, several of the, the projects uh, that are present on the spaces here. And thank you everyone for being here. Okay, Chris. Yeah, hello everyone. Um, thank you for having me as well. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, talk about some of the exciting things that everyone's working on. Um, I'm the uh, co-founder and CEO at Verita. Um, my personal background is as a software engineer, um, building for the last 20 years, um, predominantly in, in Web2 and obviously more recently into sort of the last five or six years in, in the Web3 space. Um, I've built things like early sort of real-time search engine on, on Twitter, um, built sort of enterprise CRM uh, platforms and uh, worked a lot with, I guess, sensitive personal information and, and, uh, and data uh, at scale. And uh, I've been the sort of chief architect of the Verita network, uh, which is a decentralized uh, database storage infrastructure uh, specifically designed uh, to be very fast and to be designed for users who have their private key that can access and control um, their own data. Uh, and we're super excited, I guess, about the emerging AI space, decentralized AI, um, and very specifically the concept of personal AI and, and personal agents. And what we've built is effectively um, what we call the personal data bridge. And so we're facilitating individuals to uh, connect to any Web2 platform, such as, you know, Facebook or Apple, Google, um, healthcare systems, financial systems, and allow users to basically do a vampire attack and, and pull all of their personal data down from those systems, store that data um, encrypted um, on the Verita network using, uh, secured by a private key. And then we provide consent, we provide other infrastructure, allowing that data to be used in Web3 applications. And so one of the key areas that we're working with is, is projects um, in AI and allowing people's personal data to be 
connected to LLMs and connected into AI agents um, and really provide, uh, I guess, this core data bridge um, for users to connect their data into this emerging AI space. And Jeff? Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having me. So my name is Jeff, and I'm the council member for uh, Deep Brain Chain. Uh, just a little word on, on this chain. This is a fairly old chain established in 2017. Uh, we provide a decentralized high-performance GPU computing network that can uh, scale infinitely. Uh, our goal here is to become the most widely used GPU computing infrastructure in the, uh, in the AI plus metaverse era. Um, the, uh, currently, the Deep Brain Chain is managed and promoted by the Deep Brain Chain Foundation and the Deep Brain Chain Council. Uh, and uh, we have experienced some evolutions. Uh, there, there was a, uh, a major change back in 2021, and now the mainnet of the new DB DBC AI chain is launched. And uh, please uh, uh, welcome to check it out uh, on our website. Uh, there's a lot of exciting developments in our chain. And I'm also uh, in charge of uh, a company called uh, Decentral GPT. This is a project that built upon the Deep Brain Chain Network. And this is a uh, large language inference model. Uh, I will actually elaborate this a little bit more later. Uh, so yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you, gentlemen. And today, the first topic will be decentralization and AI infrastructure. So first question to I Aiton. How does ZK AGI integrate zero knowledge proofs into its decentralized AI infrastructure? Yeah, absolutely. So I, it's it, the entire ZK AGI network is a combination of several, you know, cryptographic mechanisms to ensure, you know, data privacy and security. Uh, so one of the core technologies that we're innovating on is called zero knowledge machine learning. Um, and uh, uh, this is essentially used uh, for verification and for settlement of, uh, you know, the uh, settlement on the blockchain itself. Um, so essentially, most of the data that that's being used to train or retrain the system is uh, getting wrapped as proofs and uh, and then this is uh, being used to you know train or retrain the the AI models um, however we also use a combination of other techniques like uh, uh, fully homomorphic encryption and uh, federated learning uh, in in this entire value chain of uh, of AI for for different components for example on the computational Part we're actually leveraging FHE, um, and then on uh, for retraining of the model we generally leverage, uh, um, you know, federated learning. But um, somewhere you know in the pipeline where um, um, you know it, it makes sense, the the data is getting wrapped into uh, zero knowledge proofs, and then the uh, various algorithmic operations are happening on those zero knowledge proofs. Um, hence, uh, you know, that's, that's the way we kind of use zero knowledge proofs in the, in the network. Doug, how does Exhibits leverage decentralized networks to manage and process large data sets for AI? Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, so Exhibits looks at decentralization from the scope of ownership. And so we're fragmenting our compute resources and then tokenizing it so that you know, literally anybody can participate in the currency of the future, uh, AKA AI compute. So we're, we're not necessarily addressing that layer within our stack, but we do uh, enable through Kubernetes, we do enable um, our users a uh, basically, a, a, you know, their, their own fresh palette to where they can apply things like uh, ZK GI or other technologies that, um, you know, create securitization of uh, data sets. Jeff, how does the brain chain ensure cost effective decentralized AI computation? Uh, yeah, so uh, so basically we um, have developed this like a uh, state of art uh, AI pu public chain. Uh, we come from a, a long way uh, from, you know, GPU rating platform in version one. 
to uh, this version currently. Uh, this version actually provides a innovative way for all the future AI projects to build our ecosystem, uh, a way to issue their own tokens to the miners so they can enjoy the free access to the GPU computing sources uh, while uh, reducing the cost uh, of overall uh, uh, user experiences. So user can uh, pay like a fraction of price of the centralized uh, uh, GPU, I mean the uh, uh, large language model uh, services. So I think that's the uh, uh, really a uh, innovative technology to uh, explore. Uh, this new way of, of doing things. And Chris, how does Veridis infrastructure support user-centric data control in a decentralized AI environment? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, it's a really interesting question. We're all familiar with obviously blockchains and you know the idea of having your private key, um, which can control your digital assets. And Verita takes that concept a bit further and says, hey, your private key can also control a digital identity and it can also control um, all of your data. Um, and you know, when I say all of your data, I'm referring to things like your healthcare data, your financial data, your social media posts, your private chat messages, your email history, um, all of that you know, personal private data that we all collect across the, uh, across the internet and you know, across all sorts of different services today. And um, you know, the Verita infrastructure is basically designed to say, hey, if you've got this private key, um, that key can unlock access to decentralized database storage infrastructure. Um, and, you know, you can effectively use a token to pay to access that infrastructure. Uh, and you can store all of your data um, on this network that's designed to be private first. Um, all the data is encrypted. Um, your key, um, you know, can facilitate the signing of data, the encryption of data, the um, access controls around your data. And um, it's not just, I guess, about um, storing the data, but it's also the consent and the access control around the data. And this is where it gets very interesting with um, decentralized AI, because as an individual, once you have your data and you've bridged it across and, and are storing in the Verita network, you can now um, consent to third party applications such as personal AI agents and, and AI prompts and other products that are using AI to connect your data in to those um, those models. And so that could be connecting in for the uh, for training purposes or um, using a, a sort of a RAG tile, style approach with inference um, to sort of do real-time searches of your data. Um, there's a whole range of different ways there that uh, your data as an individual can be accessed and then made available to different decentralized AI um, products and services. And I think what's super interesting about this space is obviously there's a few um, different compute sort of architectures that are being discussed. Um, but I think that eventually we'll end up with autonomous agents and the idea of those agents having their own um, decentralized identity, having tokenization to facilitate payments with those agents, um, facilitate payments and micropayments um, with uh, data flows. I think that's going to be really interesting. And, and you know, decentralization crypto um, has, a, I think, a really important role to play um, with this emerging AI space and facilitating um, those different roles that agents will need in the future. Okay, great answers. Now we can move on to data privacy and security. So first question for Aiden. How does zero-knowledge proofs enchant data privacy and security in ZKGIS model? Yeah, so I think fundamentally one has to understand what a zero-knowledge proof itself is. Right. Um, so you can prove that you know the value of something without revealing the value itself. For example, uh, right when I'm walking into a nightclub, let's say, right, uh, I can prove that I'm above the age of 18 without explicitly telling them, you know, my exact date of birth. Now that's that's an example of you know a zero knowledge proof in action. Um, so typically, this is the way it works, and uh, this is the fundamental premise on which you know, zero knowledge machine learning is working. So you're able to derive insights on these proofs. You're able to do computations on these proofs without exposing the underlying, you know, sensitive data. Uh, and this is uh, this is ensuring the data privacy. Um, and in the ZK GI value chain, there is more, you know, techniques than just zero knowledge machine learning uh, that's, uh, you know, uh, being leveraged to ensure, you know, data privacy and, 
high performance uh so uh you know the the various techniques as i mentioned earlier are you know fully homomorphic encryption and uh, also federated learning for the retraining component uh, of the ai model so thereby you know uh of course you know data is being you know preserved you know in, in a privacy environment and at the same time you know the performance is not compromised in the zkgi network so uh these are the various you know um kinds of uh, uh optimizations that we're doing um you know throughout the network to ensure that you know privacy you know cannot be compromised and performance is also not compromised so this is what you know keeps us up at night Doug, what unique approaches does Exabit take to ensure data privacy and security in its decentralized framework? Yeah, thanks so much. So again, we you know we offer a compute through Kubernetes. So this creates a very versatile system, and this enables the user to use whatever methods that work for their project to maintain their data security. And so, really, you you know our focus is in um, providing optimum compute. And on the data security side and on uh, data privacy, we offer the ability for, uh, you know, for our customers uh, and users to um, approach this however they see fit, um, and which includes, you know, ZK AGI, um, Lumeran, other uh, layers on top of uh, exhibits that have been successful. Jeff, what security measures are in place in DeepBrain Chain's network to protect AI computations and data? Yes, the DeepBrain Chain actually uh, uh, does not uh, provide a lot of uh, securities on that ma matter because uh, we only provide the decentralized computing. That's our focus. Uh, however, uh, for the application uh, that build on our ecosystem, they will have a very uh, uh, strict uh, encryption and uh, all these data security measures placed. For example, the decentral GBT project that uh, is a la large language model inference network uh, that is built on DBC. Uh, all the data and the prompts that users provide will be encrypted on their computer and will be uh, uh, interact with the smart contracts online, online this technology. So I, I will say uh, it's pretty secure. Mm -hmm. And Chris, how does Verida ensure data privacy and integrity for its users within its decentralized network? So, um, yeah, Verida is uh, a project that's really, really focused on, I guess, security and privacy. That's, um, you know, our core tenant from um, the very beginning of the project and something that's probably set us apart from a lot of other decentralized projects. The, you know, obviously blockchain's, for the most part, a public. Um, and so um, I'll, I'll start with the integrity part of the question. So data integrity is obviously super important. You can have as much data as you like, but if you uh, if you can't trust that data, if you don't know where it's been sourced from, um, you know, you, you know there's, there's not much integrity there. And so the Verita Network does two things. One is every piece of data is is signed and it can be signed by multiple parties. So that can facilitate you know receiving a piece of data and you can then verify the signatures and um, you know there's a certain level of integrity there or trust that you have around the origin of that data and we also support data schemas that um, allow in for interoperability but also provide integrity because you know what type of data it is that you're actually dealing with um, on the on the privacy side um, again we've we've taken I guess the enterprise type security model and and privacy model where um, uh, you know, we have encryption built in to the network, but just as importantly, we actually have authentication built in. So there's obviously lots of storage networks out there that exist today, um, but uh, encryption isn't a part of the protocol, um, but you can still encrypt data and store it on, you know, IPFS or Arweave um, and services like that. But the data is still public. Um, it's, it's encrypted, but it's on a public network. And so if that, if a public, uh, you know, uh, if the data is ever, um, the, the private key, sorry, is ever um, exposed, that data forever will be um, exposed as well. And similarly, you know, at some point we'll get some level of quantum encryption, which will put all of that data that's in the public domain, but encrypted at risk. 
And so with the reader network um, has an authentication and authorization layer. So um, you actually can't access the encrypted data unless you sign consent messages um, across the network using um, the private key that controls the data. Um, and to also uh, enable access to third parties, you have to sign consent messages and, and change protocols around, um, you know, who can have access, who can have read, write access um, uh, to the to the data as well. So for us, um, encryption is great, but it's only a part of the story. We also have authorization authentication um, built into this decentralized protocol, which is really, really important for that security and privacy. Awesome. Now we can move up to scalability and efficiency. So Aiton. What are the main scalability challenges for ZKGI and how are you addressing them? Yeah, I think this is a great question because, uh, you know, with the level of, uh, uh, you know, cryptographic um, wizardry that's happening in ZKGI, uh, there's quite a few, uh, you know, like things to consider. Um, and one of the things we've done is actually building on Solana and uh, this allows for a um, high level of scalability and uh, you know solana being a rustic chain and you know employing the rust language uh, this allows us to interact with the hardware at the deepest level and at the lowest level and uh, this this allows like a lot of optimizations um you know throughout the throughout our zk gi um you know network so to say um that's that's one of the things Second things. Second thing is, uh, you know, there's quite a lot of testing that we do and benchmarking that we do uh, with with any kind of choice we make, uh, whether it's uh, you know a certain library that we might be using for zero knowledge proofs, or um, you know it, it might be um, you know something that uh, like a like a mathematical function we might be using. Uh, so so you know we we try to custom. Uh, tune these uh, mathematical, you know, functions and um, also these different approaches all the time to to ensure uncompromising, you know, performance. So um, yeah, it's quite exciting, you know, to to be able to deliver something that's uh, that's quite performant and to do this in a decentralized manner. So uh, this this has been one of the ongoing, I would say, like exciting um areas for zk gi to be working on and uh yes we're getting through these challenges with time and uh yeah soon we should have uh something out in the next few weeks hopefully doug how does exhibits manage to efficiently process and add decentralized yeah thanks um so there's a common misconception about decentralized compute that uh, that it should be geo distributed across a network but the idea of connecting you know random devices into a geo distributed network to form uh, a power grid type network just it just doesn't work and so and this is a very mature business the compute providing ai compute to serious you know ai projects um, for training, inference, and fine tuning. This is a very mature space. And so we believe that the value to the customer should come first, um, not just a narrative. And these, these customers will never pay for a narrative. So we offer the scarce, you know, H100, A100, 4090s, and soon B200 GPU machines coming from AI ready data centers. And, and we're tokenizing this compute and offering it to the world so anyone can participate in the AI compute economy. Um, and so, uh, you know, we're offering, you know, our, our compute is, is really, um, you know, it's AI data center. And so it's not quote unquote geo distributed or decentralized in that manner. Um, but uh, we, so we provide the compute as a, a you know, product offering first and then we decentralize uh, the fragmented compute uh, in 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 ownership, you know, we provide ownership on the decentralized side too. Uh, um, it's important to us that data security, it, the data is secure, which is why we allow our customers full ability to um, use uh, their mechanisms for this. And Chris, so what strategies does Verida employ to scale its decentralized data management solutions? Yeah, so. Um... Yeah, it's a great question. As, as mentioned, I mean, scalability is is obviously critical in this space. 
Um, we have, a, I guess, a few pieces of the puzzle. So um, there's a we make a distinction in the design of the, the protocol between distributed and decentralized in the sense that um, when you're thinking about user data, um, uh, and similar to the previous question about, I guess, geographical diversity, um, when you're thinking about user data, you actually want the user to be in control of where their data is stored. Um, you don't want data to be fragmented all around the world. You want it to be quite fast and responsive. And so the approach um, that we've taken is more about replication of data, um, doing that in a really fast and performant way, doing that in a scalable way, rather than sharding data and splitting it up all over the web, because that's an incredibly inefficient way to um, have a very fast response time and a performant response um, for user data, which is which is really, really important if you're dealing with consumer level applications that where users expect, you know, second or sub-second type latencies. Um, you can't have minutes for, for data to be downloading across a whole bunch of different shards um, and discovering different nodes and things like that. So, um, you know, the performance that consumers expect is a really important part of our design and, and a part of how we've built the architecture for the scalability. Um, and a part of that equation for us as well is we make heavy use of, um, of I guess, the authentication um, that I discussed earlier um, to unlock uh, direct WebSocket connections between nodes and uh, between consumer applications. And so um, that allows us to uh, effectively scale the performance um, on a per user basis. So for instance, you can write data once to the network and it can be near instantly um, shared with a whole bunch of other applications, AI agents or or decentralized apps in real time because there's a whole bunch of WebSocket connections there that are, are sort of scaling that on a per user basis. And then if you look at it at a macro level across the whole network, because we have this um, sort of per user approach, we effectively have sharding by design because we have sharding on a per user basis as opposed to sharding the, the data fragments. And so um, we effectively get a scaling, um, a scalability uh, out of that, out of the box because of that um, sort of user-based sharding approach. So um, it doesn't really matter uh, how many users we have. Um, there's only sort of a max limit there to the amount of storage that a user really is, is, is going to use in the end of the day. Um, and we can handle the replicas of that, um, you know, and shard those, those users across the network in a really scalable fashion. Great, so now we can move on to interoperability and collaboration. So Aiton, how does the KGI ensure interoperability and other decentralized AI platforms and systems? Yeah, there's, um, you know, two tangents to this uh, interoperability. Uh, the first thing is, uh, you know, while we are Solana centric at the start, uh, we also want to be available to users from other chains and also, you know, have our token on chains besides Solana, thereby expanding the vast amounts of people who will be interacting with our system. And, um, you know, with more people kind of interacting with any kind of AI system, you know, the system becomes better and better. So uh, that's one. Number two is, uh, you know, our whole approach of kind of collaborating and partnering with uh, projects to supplement our compute layer uh, while, you know, um, there there might be certain projects that are very focused on just kind of building their own supply and demand for, uh, you know, GPUs and CPUs, the way ZKGI looks at it is, uh, you know, being like an aggregator of compute and then kind of channelizing the compute to actually perform the AI computations and focusing more on the demand uh, aspect of the uh, compute itself uh, and putting that into use to, to to do privacy AI computations. Thereby, uh, you know, we are interoperable with several other, uh, you know, deepened compute providers and other deepened protocols. Even if uh, you consider the case of, uh, you know, data deepens. Uh, uh, so uh, in this way, you know, we are collaborating and. Uh, uh, integrating with uh, various other deepens as well uh, so that, you know, there's an end, um, you know, value creation that's being done for developers and enterprises and users and uh, uh, not so much, uh, you know, building in a silo and um, building, you know, something which is very, um, you know, different from everybody else. Instead, like we're looking to compete. We're not looking to compete, as I always say. 
So uh, this is the way we're approaching interoperability. And Doug, what steps is Exhibit taking to promote collaboration and interoperability in the decentralized AI space? I think I think I'll answer by saying this. So you know, real AI compute is so scarce and, and expensive. So you know, we're focusing a hundred percent on onboarding customers and optimizing and accelerating compute, um, building out supply and building the best tokenization mechanism for participation. Um, so on, on the data side, you know, we're supporting projects like Hyperbolic, like Nimble, Heuris, um, ZK AGI, Morpheus, Lumia, um, to provide these essential data layers. So, um, yeah, so we're integrating these different technologies within our stack. Um, and we, you know, we, we empower our users to do that. Um, so that's, you know, so that's how we're contributing to the interoperability um, uh, across our, our, our network. And Jeff, how does the brain chain facilitate interoperability with other AI and blockchain networks? Uh, so we are the AI public chain and, uh, we, uh, develop technologies to, uh, support all these ecosystem projects. For example, uh, we have one called deep link. It's a cloud computing gaming platform and, uh, they utilize our, uh, technology, the DPC technology to uh, set up a uh, lot of data centers in South Korea. And uh, the performance is pretty good. And uh, this is a example of how we uh, promote this interoperability uh, with other uh, ecosystem projects. And Chris, what does Verida support? How does Verida, I'm sorry, support inter integration with existing decentralized applications and other AI platforms? You know, as I've talked about before, you know, our objective is to how, allow individuals to um, own their data. And so the obvious question is, yeah, how do third party applications, decentralized applications or AI platforms get access to, to a user's data? And so today we have a developer SDK. So we have a library that you can integrate as a developer and uh, you can effectively um, ask the user to sign in. The user signs into your application. Um, and can then authorize access to uh, their data. We've got a lot of controls around that. You know, you can unlock access to a whole range of databases. You can unlock access to specific databases, um, to specific types of data. Um, you can provide read access or read write access. Um, there's a whole range of controls that you have there as a user and as an application developer to get an alignment there around what that integration looks like. Um, and one of the things that we've kind of realized and, and have started to, to work on as well is, a, is another form of integration, which is more like a traditional, um, you know, OAuth style authentication. So when you um, sign in with, say, Google or Facebook, you know, we're familiar with OAuth type logins where you sign in with, with Google and, and then you sort of authenticate and say, hey, these are the different permissions that I'm giving this application, you know, access to. Uh, we're actually looking to create a similar type of architecture, um, which uh, makes it a lot easier for existing applications to integrate with, not just decentralized apps, but traditional Web2 apps and emerging AI platforms. Um, and the other benefit of this approach is that um, you don't have to integrate an SDK, which can be complex to some developers, but you effectively end up with an API endpoint that's incredibly fast. And so particularly when it comes to AI, where performance is really important, um, you know, thinking about having, uh, you know, your last 10 years of emails that might need to be searched in real time and connected to a large language model, um, you know, providing this really fast decentralized API access is a, a really important part of that integration and providing an experience that's going to be viable for, for end users for these types of AI use cases. Interesting answers. So now we have user engagement and ethical considerations, which is a very popular topic in the space. So Aitan, how does ZK AGI engage with its users to ensure ethical use of AI and data privacy? So one of the fundamental aims of uh, ZK AGI is to uh, address the you know human right of privacy um, and when it comes to basically you know people's data and when they interact with you know AI systems or in fact any kind of big tech even if they're not directly using AI if they're storing information like any anywhere right uh, it's going to be processed by by the people who are storing that data in 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 an unethical manner, and uh, this leads to all kinds of uh, bad things happening, like ranging from scams to anything you know beyond scams uh, uh, that 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 happens with you know data breaches. So 
when when you do a 180 spin on um, you know how these systems are designed and how you can process you know sensitive data so that uh, you're still able to derive insights and you're still able to you know create new kinds of transformations for users and Doug, uh, what incentives does exhibits offer to users to ethically share their data yeah so again you know we create a containerized gpu uh compute offerings uh through uh, containerized gpu machines which enables um you know clean and clear throughput and the ability for um you know our users to apply whatever technologies um best uh you know protect data and incentivize their end users and so by you know not uh you know requiring our users to uh, use a certain type of technology around um data security and you know incentivizing the incentivization layer of, of data sharing we offer that um that that democratization to uh to our customers Jeff, uh, how does the brain chain address ethical considerations in decentralized AI computation? So at the very fundamental level, we are a uh, computing power uh, resource provider. So um, we don't want to be like an arbiter for what, uh, what models or what technology is ethical or not, because we don't have the ability to. Uh, however, uh, we encourage uh, 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 like mainstream or uh, ethical moral standards, and for example, if we host we uh, if if we host uh, any uh, large language model like an open source uh, Llama model, for example, and uh, they have already uh, implemented a very basic uh, uh, moral guideline on uh, what uh, what will be uh, the results, what will not, what what will be the acceptable moral morally acceptable results, uh, what will not be so uh, at from that perspective, we don't we uh no we don't we don't want to be the judge of uh, uh we, we let we let the users to decide on on that. And Chris, how does Verida empower users to manage their data ethically and responsibly? Yeah, so there's a lot of nuance to that question. Um, but I guess at a at a there's a few pieces. So the technical level, um, you know, as I've touched on before, we allow users to have a private key and um. That key is the ability, you know, it gives them the ability to unlock access to their data and, and decrypt their data. So we're empowering them and giving them full, um, full consent, full control over their data. Um, the problem is obviously that the everyone's data today is is stored in lots of other systems, um, and those systems don't necessarily act ethically with your user data. Um, they can be victims of you know data breaches. They can misuse your data. They can sell it. And so we kind of live in an environment today where data is um, a bit gray in terms of how it's treated. Um, you know, some companies have good ethical policies and are responsible, other ones aren't so much. So um, you've got in Europe, you've got GDPR, which has uh, mandates and, and has some con dictates to companies, um, you know, what is and isn't acceptable around the management of user data. And in many cases now is um, forcing companies and organizations to allow users to take ownership of their data. And so um, we're kind of leveraging that uh, regulatory trend um, and, uh, you know, this sort of growing awareness and need from users to have privacy to um, facilitate users to, to take their data back, to um, pull their data from other centralised platforms, take ownership of that data um, and, you know, retain that ultimate control. And so in a... Uh, in a future world, we hope that by enabling people to take ownership and control of their data from centralized platforms, we're unlocking that data to then bridge across to decentralized alternatives. So, you know, you can pull your data from uh, a, de you know, uh, Twitter or Facebook and then move that across to a decentralized social media platform that's an alternative um, and a platform that manages data in a more ethical way, more responsibly and is controlled, um, you know, maybe by a DAO or is controlled by users and their private keys. So, we're empowering this, I guess, at a, a technological level, but then also, I guess, at a more macro philosophical level of, of this transition from a centralized, um, you know, set of applications that control our data to a decentralized environment where we all have choice and control over what applications we use and, and how our data is used with them. 
Very nice. So now we have some general questions for everyone. I would love for all speakers to pitch in with their opinions. So first off, we have the future of decentralized AI. So what is your long-term vision for the future of decentralized AI? And how do you see your project contributing to that vision? How about we kick this off with Jeff? All right, I'll take this one. Uh, so I, I would say like I, I've been in this uh, the deep brain chain for many years, and I've seen the evolution of uh, decentralized AI, right? Uh, coming from uh, a sort of a GPU rental platform to now tokenization economics models, uh, uh, tokenomics model built into uh, the whole uh, platform infrastructure and, and incentivize people to uh, really participate in this uh, evolution um, of AI uh, rather than just a couple of big boys, you know, uh, getting all the profits and the profitabilities. Um, so I would say like um, uh, education is a big part of it, and uh, uh, try to try to educate uh, you know the users uh, how they can get benefit from uh, you know participating in these kind of platforms, and uh, 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 get some economic incentive uh, on top of all these uh, utilities they will get. That uh, would be great. Also, uh, another thing in addition to that is we uh, we are building a. Uh, uh, decentral GBT, which is a, a decentralized uh, uh, sort of similar to ChatGBT services, uh, and we are we are uh, promoting and supporting the open source model. Uh, we are a big believer of the open source, and uh, um, that I think that will could be a, a mega trend in the future to to allow everybody to uh, 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 build and enjoy the benefits of it. Yeah, that's my my take. Any thoughts on that, uh, Doug? Yeah, I think, um, you know, when we think about decentralized AI, what we're really talking about is independent AI, you know, um, is, is looking at this, at artificial intelligence from a realistic lens, which is that in the very near future, you know, there's going to be a tidal wave that hits humanity, which is AI. And the question is, how, how do we, what, what's the future that we want to see around this development? Because, you know, centralized or, or non-independent AI presents a lot of tremendous challenges for humanity in general. And independent AI provides a world where you know, AI highly improves our experience as earthlings. And I think that, you know, one of the challenges that we face, especially as technologists, is looking at this from a pan back, pan back enough from our projects and our perspectives on, on these things that we're hyper-focused on and looking at this big picture, not only as business use cases, but also as this broader uh, spectrum that, affects the you know our our legacies our children and everything and so i think that one of the challenges that a market as a marketer as a storyteller that i see is 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 telling the story in an effective way telling the story in a way that is going to land uh in so far as to support our our missions um and and align our missions and so i think you know, there's projects like Morpheus that we're connected with, and there's different projects that are highly decentralized that uh, on a, at scale that enable um, the application of these technologies and the um, you know and and the proliferation and the advancement of these technologies in a way that uh, serves humanity and and de and creates an independent landscape uh, for AI. So it's kind of a long answer it's uh hopefully hopefully that landed awesome so now regulatory landscape how do you navigate the varying regulatory landscapes across different regions for decentralized ai can i get your thoughts on that Ethan? yeah i think uh one of the uh major concerns with uh, ai in general has been the uh data privacy you know because ai is very data intensive kind of a technology right so um, therefore, you know, like ZK AGI is already taking care of that. Any builder building with, uh, you know, ZK AGI tools is uh, uh, complying with uh, GDPR or any of the other data protection rules. So this is one of the 
aspects of um, you know complying with regulation. The other aspect of complying with regulations in AI is actually the the ethics. Uh, you know because as uh, these technologies mature and as uh, they become more powerful, uh, they also you know create a lot of opportunities for the wrong people as well. So uh, what are you know the the moral guidelines you know that the AI will follow? you know, so as to not, you know, like put human beings under threat or, um, you know, like marginalized communities and uh, uh, things of this nature, because in some ways, you know, like uh, AI is still, um, you know, kind of uh, thing for the haves and, you know, the have-nots do not have access to AI. So uh, we need to create more opportunity for all stratas of society and all people around the planet to interact with AI, to leverage the powers of AI and to you know, benefit from the vast amounts of productivity that comes from the AI. Uh, so, you know, by decentralizing AI itself, uh, I think ZK AGI is addressing this this aspect as well. So what recent technological innovation in decentralized AI are you most excited about and why? Yeah, so we're excited about projects like Morpheus because they're truly decentralized AI and there's no, you know, there's no head um and they are at the ai agent layer and so we believe the way for us to build the future that we you know that we want to see is through independent ai and projects like like this um so yeah so lumerant uh, zk agi um there's many projects that we're we're super bullish and that we're excited about um partnering with okay how about you Ethan? yeah i think there's always something new and always something to look forward to um, I think besides the innovation, I'm, you know, most looking forward to more releases in the decentralized AI segment, you know, with more live products and more user interaction, you know, uh, more, um, you know, like use cases, you know, come to fruition and, uh, you know, they, they come to the table also, like, you know, new um, kind of opportunities uh, will be discovered right now. You know, it's it's operating in a very theoretical lens, like most people are building, but users are not interacting with so many of these systems. I think with more adoption, I think, uh, you know, that's that's what I'm looking forward to more than anything. Okay, and now challenges and opportunities. So what are the biggest challenges and opportunities do you foresee for the decentralized AI in industry in the next few years? Uh, Jeff, do you have any thoughts? Um, so for this one, I think the models uh, that I'm seeing is uh, like, like I just mentioned earlier, uh, the open versus close and uh, closed source models. Uh, I think that will be the uh, 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 challenges and opportunities uh, both. Uh, I will say that on the opportunity side, I think uh, a lot of people can leverage these open source models and build vertical uh, spe specific models in you know different areas like medical, finance, etc. cetera. Uh, however, the challenges that, that requires a lot of uh, uh, concentrated computing power uh, to to train these data and how uh, as an industry participant solve these problems uh, for these uh, innovators and uh, entrepreneurs is you know this is what DBC is trying to do uh, to provide a decentralized AI computing solutions uh, at a fractional cost so yeah and the last question for today that we have is, can you share any exciting collaborations or partnerships that your product is currently engaged in or planning? So how about you, Chris? Yeah, apologies. I've, um, the audio has been dropping out a little bit. Um, actually, I just want to jump back to the challenges and opportunities for two seconds, because I think that one of the big challenges is, uh, is really privacy. And I think there's some talk about that that's happened and there's some great projects on this uh, spaces that are, are looking at the privacy side of things but you know decentralization by default is public infrastructure and so having um, private ai private data proprietary models um, that's sensitive uh, you know data compute that needs to be kept private and so i think the challenge here is going to be how do we do keep keep things private keep the data private the compute private but do it in a way that's performant um, and competes with centralized alternatives but also, um, you know, the decentralization, you know, the Web3 movement is a lot about collaboration and integrations. And so security and privacy, um, uh, you know, you only need one little uh, weak spot and the whole thing can fail. And so making sure that those integrations um, between different technologies and different ecosystem partners 
um, provide that end-to-end -end privacy and security is going to be really, really important. And so I think that, uh, you know, doing that in a, in a, in a way that's practical, but also, um, you know, addresses the performance needs of, um, of AI is going to be really critical. And obviously where there's a challenge, there's, there's some great opportunities to be focusing on that as a problem space. Um, back to the actual collaborations and partnerships questions. Um, can't make an official announcement today, but we are working with some really exciting projects that are doing things like creating digital twins. Um, you know, the idea of having all of your personal data um, trained in a model or a, or a model, having access to that, to be able to then um, talk to and, and provide uh, sort of a personal AI assistant that um, is working on your behalf and doing that in a in a decentralized way. So we have a number of partners in the works that we're collaborating with behind the scenes, and are really excited to share um, some official announcements on that in the in the coming weeks and months. That's great to hear. How about you, Doug? Yeah. Well, for one thing, our partnership with ZK AGI we're super excited about, and we're also working with uh, the Proof of Inference Consortium. I don't know if you're familiar, but there's it's a it's a uh, it's a large consortium with the uh, you know intention of creating proof of inference, um, which is you know a movement towards independent AI. AI. Um, and uh, we're also working with He2, which we have an AMA tomorrow with with this team um, discussing you know data provenance and more. Purist, Morpheus, Venice, Wire dot Network, six zero seven nine, and and many more. Um, and so we're just super interested in the interoperability of, of, of so many aspects of Web3 and AI. How about you, Ethan? Yeah, we're super excited with all the partners that are on the space itself. And beyond this, I think uh, some of the work that we have ongoing with a lot of the compute and data deepens um, or, you know, like there's even web scraping deepens that we're partnering with. Uh, this is quite interesting for us. Um, yeah, mainly because, uh, you know, now that uh, we're gathering the compute into our cluster, uh, you know, from variety of sources, we are doing hardware acceleration on those to produce zero knowledge proofs and, uh, you know, running some, you know, very cool AI models on top. Uh, which preserve privacy. So, you know, all these experiments are happening in the labs. So we're quite excited with, uh, you know, all the new compute that's entering the cluster and also all the users that are partaking in the cluster program. Um, of course, um, you know, we will be, uh, you know, like incentivizing users at a later point for, for their contributions and uh, helping us kind of construct the network from, from the ground up. So, yeah, super excited with the building process. And Jeff, any exciting things for the future to share? Yeah, so Deep Brain Chain has uh, uh, collaborated with uh, many uh, soon to be launched projects. Uh, so, so we are a uh, brand ourselves as an AI public chain. So, uh, uh, there's going to be a bunch of uh, uh, you know large language model, text to text, text to video, text to uh, image, uh, etc. Uh, projects will be launched and uh, yeah we're excited to to announce these uh, in the near future and I just want to highlight one project uh, Decentral GBT it's a text to text uh, large language inference model built on uh, DBC and uh, it's being launched already and uh, uh, users can go in and try out the product uh, the first 10 million users will get free tokens uh, so yeah I'll be very excited to to share all these exciting news in the near future. So we have a question from Exxon. When will DBC be listed in the new exchanges? I, I don't have a specific answer to that question, uh, but uh, uh, we can refer to a specific council member uh, who's in charge of the uh, uh, listing on uh, new exchanges. Uh, but so far we have been listed uh, several uh, large exchanges, including OK and and uh, 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 the uh, Huobi, yeah. Okay, there seems to be no more questions. So thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, the speakers. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thanks to all the listeners and wishing everyone a good day.